Just so it's not misinterpreted as uh, an attempt to sidestep questions, comments, criticisms, I'm, I'm happy to kick off with <laughs> any comments or requests on my presentation, and then we'll move into an open discussion to the panel and pose questions. Yes, Mark. Um, yeah, in, in response to your presentation, uh, two points. First, I, I share, judging from, from my experience, from our experience, particularly in Germany, I share your view on the public institutions and on, on planning institutions, that they lost confidence, that they lost their, their strong emphasis on realizing things, developing the strategy, and they lost their position in bargaining with uh, investors and capital. Whatever, for whatever reason, I don't know exactly whether this is uh, following the, the neoliberal uh, agenda in, in general or particular at local levels as a consequence of new introducing new public management, which led to the consequence that they lost a lot of um, step, a lot of uh, authority and, and power in general. It's a bit generalized, but I think this is one reason why they, they are not in a good shape, and so I share the view on the public side. What I don't understand, and where I may disagree, <coughs> is your praise of the, the corporate, particularly corporate advisor, the McKinley people. Uh, I'm, I have my doubts whether, whether they are a good example for strategic planning, since McKinley is, is have certain parts of the, the discussion in Germany, they are seen as the blueprint for how to make uh, the corporation fit for the global market by uh, getting off uh, a third or half of uh, employees, but anything else. No strategy, just uh, um, making, making, the, uh, making the company a lean company uh, in terms of magnitude, but not in terms uh, of uh, smart company and intelligent company with strategy. So I have my doubts and, and I, I, I don't want to count on Enron and all these other uh, events which uh, uh, have led to the effect that the, the confidence in, in corporate managers, particularly board people, if you look at, uh, at corporations, uh, extremely hierarchical, maybe that board people have their strategy, but in the building management and all these um, complex uh, structures within those organizations. I, I don't really trust the assumption that these corporations follow a key strategy and they are good examples for, um, yeah, for um, developing strategic planning. <coughs> CSR is at least at the risk that there is another greenwashing after the technologically responsible corporate uh, management and philosophy did not lead that far as it was promised 10 years, 15 years ago. So I'm a bit uh, cautious on the, the, uh, on the state of, of the corporate actor as a good example where strategic planning or the public should look at. Okay, I, I think uh, maybe uh, I didn't explain my position well enough. Uh, just as you have good ideas coming from academia, you have bad ones too. And I, I think that what we have here in the case of the scenario planning for Shell and the uh, alchemy of growth thinking um, from, from McKinsey um, and the work from IBM, uh, Dave Snowden's work from IBM. Uh, one, one thing is significant is that the Alchemy for Growth was not published as McKinsey report, it was published as a book, which was done for McKinsey. Um, that may say something, it may not say something. Good ideas come from different places, and I, I, I think that in that regard, um, the examination of sustained growth from a, a three uh, steps uh, approach is, is, is one to be praised. This doesn't need, mean that I praise uh, uh, McKinsey, and I think that this kind of pro and against, 
perhaps my, my rhetoric even suggested that, but I, I don't think it's healthy anymore for this ping pong uh, private versus public. The, the, the message that's trying to come out here is that if one is going to get genuine partnership to work in this reality, particularly given the global challenges that we've got, there needs to be sensible thinking from wherever it comes. And in this case, in the, in the Shell case, it came in whenever it was in the 70s, and um, in the case of the others, it came more recently. So I hope that clarifies my point. I'm not promoting a particular company here. I'm promoting the ideas that come from that company. Um, and as I said, there are good ideas that come from universities and bad ideas. It doesn't mean you, you criticize the university because you've had some bad ideas come from it. Hey, um As I understand it, they, they did a survey of 30 companies and they reported on the survey. Uh, now, but, but the point I'm making yeah. is that um, a small business, um, Shilbert argued that the role the great virtue of the capitalist system was that it swept away the inefficient and the outdated and the useless. And of course, many businesses which go up, they don't have the But Enron, I don't think size prevents companies from getting bust. Enron, uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, yes. Yeah. Uh, your very good question was where did the notion that the private sector does not need a strong public sector come from? Uh, I mean, I think this is critical for everybody, actually, um, because the, the, the several books which have argued that, first of all, it comes from Grant Hyatt wrote uh, the book The Road to Certain back in the 1940s and, and did a lot of positive sort of conceptual groundwork. And his, his um, mentor on my thesis. Um, and this was translated into, or, or, or sort of transferred to incredibly well funded right wing think tanks throughout the world, right. um, funded by big companies, uh, which promoted these ideas. and. Um, actually translated them into specific policies for government to adopt. Correct. They found very governments uh, looking for something to do, There's, uh, some ideas to pick up. Found it very easy to grab hold of these. And, the, uh, and some ideologues in, in treasuries and governments around the world, certainly in Australia, picked these ideas up and embedded them. Yeah. Um, in, and I think <coughs> the process of socialization um, from, from one state to another state, and what we're looking at now, I would like to think is um, a sort of counter process um, with, with, with climate change as, as a critical lever. And I think there is a tipping point here. Um, as and nobody's mentioned Sir Nicholas Stern, who has had a huge impact in Australia. But well, he was sacked well, here. He was sacked here. Well, it didn't, didn't have much impact for sacking in Australia. In fact, I think it went down rather well because it showed that he must be not the government. Therefore, must have something useful to say. Um, so the, the current um, uh, oh, state governments around Australia, which are all Labour ones, have taken on Stern in quite a big way, and are trying to find ways of translating what he's saying into practice. So there is hope, I think, in, in this well, process of socialisation. I, I think you, you use the word socialisation very very politely. I think that there's a, a form of propagandization uh, really taking place. Well, it's all fun. Yeah. I, I, there is, I, I had a, a long discussion with your colleague Paul Meese in, in uh, Melbourne about this subject and we, we were arguing about uh, where did the notion of the logic that you can separate the railway track from the company and from the service, where did that logic come from? And I, I had always innocently thought that Universities were, were um, ivory towers of little influence, little impact, but actually it was Gabriel Roth. Um, and, and we began one by one to identify Alan Waters, Gabriel Roth, a uh, number of personalities who had academic 
uh, um, academic credentials, academic positions, who then moved into international agencies and who then passed on these myths, these contagious myths. Let's not be told, I mean, th there are instances where, uh, there are instances, of course, where there is a lot of truth in it, but um, I'm not talking about those for the moment. Um, and there has also been some investigative um, journalism which shows that the same principle goes with the myth that globalization is based upon competitiveness alone rather than collaboration, that it's been hijacked. The concept of globalization as a concept you cannot deny. But the, if you read and interpret and you read Ohm and you read the guy, even, even, even Marcel, um, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, anyway, the, the uh, Spanish guy. Um, there's been a hijacking. There's been a hijacking of, 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 of ideas, visions, and this is where I think your work is actually very important in terms of path dependency, know, knowing where we are coming from, how they've been influential. But to look at the past, I would argue, is not enough. I mean, we need to know the path dependence. We need to know the history. Why in the earth did we get where we are? But the, the challenges are so critical that we have to do exactly. I don't, I don't care where people come from so long as they've got good ideas. If they're McKinsey, they're McKinsey. If they're UCL, they're UCL or whatever. You know, even King's, King's College is fine. <laughs> um, but the fact, the fact of the matter is that, that we need to look at the same time as where we've come from, where we're going. Um, and, and that's where the rhetoric, because climate change has been argued by some as being pure rhetoric, you know, by being misleading science by some until recently. Yeah, you know that. Um, sorry. <coughs> yes. There's a lovely irony about Shell and its scenario planning because um, it did scenario planning in the run up to Brent Spar, that came spectacularly unstuck. Um, and, and shortly after the unsticking, they had a, uh, a meeting of all the health, safety, environment people from the whole operation in Aberdeen. I was the invited outside speaker, um, and and I told them that they had a defective scenario. Scenario, uh, the uh, because in terms of my psychology, um, the the individualistic big business had done a deal with the government. They sorted out the law of the sea. They sorted out the science. Um, it was all sewn up, and they didn't have a scenario with Greenpeace in it. The lower right hand corner was simply absent. And, and, you know, it, it completely dumbfounded um, and, uh, and shouldn't have. But, uh, so that's the, seems to me, illustrates very strongly the, um, if you, 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 scenarios are very useful, but they're, they're no guarantee of seeing everything you ought to be seeing. Uh, the, um, that's a comment. The, the, the second one's a question. <clears throat> it's, there seemed to be running through your presentation the assumption that uh, sustained economic growth was desirable. Uh, in the um, a few years back, I was part of the OECD's project on environmentally sustainable transport, uh, and uh, they commissioned a report for me on the social consequences of hypermobility. And we spent quite a lot of time pursuing um, the um, the various transport growth scenarios as you might graph. Yeah. Um, and there was a lot of hand-waving discussion about the need to um, uh, decouple economic growth from transport growth. But nobody had the slightest idea how to do it. And it's still the case that economic growth is usually the central variable in forecasting transport growth. Sure. You, you forecast your economic growth and then you, you, you read off the graph how much, yeah. how much transport goes with it. Um, for the obvious reason that um, it's hard to imagine um, spending all your extra wealth in the future if it doesn't involve um, collecting more and spatially dispersed materials, processing and redistributing them, or traveling more to visit your friends. There's a severe limit to the number of expensive violin lessons I can afford. Uh, so it, that, that seemed to me to be a, uh, a fairly central and perhaps not yet thoroughly examined assumption of the whole project. Uh, because if, if the assumption of sustained economic growth remains there, 
And there's been a recent revival of the um, interest in the work of Fred Hirsch from about 30 years, more than 30 years ago, on social limits to growth and positional goods and all of that. Um, and and, and the, if that's your central one, then, then you've got all the other mega projects are assisting this, this transport growth. And that then leads on to, um, it seems to me, one of the uh, crucial consequences, the, the, the growth of these transnational regions. Um, does the EU itself qualify as a transnational region? Yeah, uh, as a transnational region. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Okay, well, the, one of the things I pointed out in my, in my report, that as we become more mobile, um, we, we more and more in our trading and social lives and business lives, Cross traditional authority boundaries. And the scale of problems that need governing growth um, as we do more of that. So uh, if the scale of government doesn't grow uh, to keep pace, then government simply becomes impotent. So you, you have power and authority and responsibility and accountability migrating from town hall to Whitehall to Brussels uh, to completely unaccountable organizations like the WTO. Um, and that is um, creating more and more fatalists, people who feel that the scale of things is beyond their ability to influence, fewer people bother to vote. Um, and so you have a whole host of uh, social consequences that seem to me to flow from that uh, key assumption. Right, there are a number of points there. I, I, I'm not assuming a, a position of the necessarily that sustainable vision is a single homogeneous entity. I've actually assumed that it's, um, in, indeed, we, we are each one of us doing a working paper on different dimensions of sustainability. I'm, I'm assuming that there are different interpretations of what sustainable visions are, and that some of these are context specific. Some, some of these would have, quite clearly, from the evidence-based um, and economic growth-based a premise, but the truth of the matter, it's not, a, it's not a vision that we are adopting for the project as the one that we bless or don't bless. It's a matter of finding out what's out there um, and, and seeing, well, uh, once we've seen what's out there, what sense do we make of it? Where, where do these visions come from? Um, I've made the, the, the case, <coughs> and I, I expect the evidence to be provided, um, that some of these visions are... Um, uh, mock unreal copies of the vision of sustainability. The, 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 the business camouflages with business as usual. I mean, that, that's one scenario. And the other one is that uh, there are attempts to decouple economic growth from sustainability as being the only future. The truth of the matter is, which is going back to Nick's point, um, in, if you think strategically about this, I would have thought that there are limits to what is possible, and climate change is a, is a restraining factor. I mean, at the end of the day, even if you believed that economic growth was a driving force of uh, sustainable development or sustainable urban development, uh, that can only be achieved within the constraints of X, Y, and Z, and climate is, and emissions is one of them. So um, my argument would be, I, I revert back to an assessment of the risks that go along with pursuing a particular path and a strategic way through. So I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm citing the work which um, the alchemy of growth was based upon the notion that businesses need to year, last out year in, year out, and make a profit year in, year out as their, as their, um, their area of interest. It's not. The whole issue of whether our research project should have a position, certainly from the outset, is highly questionable. I think the only position that we we really have uh, is, as I presented it, that mega transport projects um, need to be examined, re-examined in the context of the agenda of sustainable development. If we do that, what does it mean, as opposed to examining them in the context of more narrow objectives for which some of them have been delivered. And secondly, um, the premise is that looking at cost overruns and, uh, and um, project completion dates is an insufficient criteria to judge 
a project to be successful or a failure. They're the two positions that really, I, I don't think uh, I would like at certainly this stage without my <laughs> colleagues contributing to, to, to any other premises uh, positions that we, we adopt. Does that sound too political? But it's actually, <laughs> it's quite a sincere position, yeah. Comment on this, um, on, on the growth issue. I think for the poorest half of the world, economic growth is, is what they are going to demand in order to improve their lot. And the rest of us will probably go along with that because it's more palatable than redistributing the, the wealth that we have ourselves. And as a result, if you were looking at it in the transport context, the, the driver of the transport for the poorer areas has got to be to, to help deliver economic growth. And in the richer areas, it's got to be to deliver efficiency that allows us to maintain uh, a semblance of wealth without using as much of it. I think that the question, the question goes back, though, to, to Edward Mission's work. What are the costs of economic growth? To, you know, and the costs are changing. And the known costs without flattering Rumsfeld and the unknown costs. I think we need to, um, we can accept the economic growth argument as so long as we know what the real costs are of pursuing that. I think we should be careful about assuming that economic growth is necessary. just occurred to me that, I mean, th this kind of discussion is fine, but at the other end of the spectrum, uh, it, when we look at case studies, the purpose is not to make moral judgments. I mean, you can do a moral judgment about what, uh, what's happened, but it's actually to record and state why, for example, in, the, in, in, in one case, the model of growth is, is trickle-down Whereas another project may have, it may be instigated totally to actually redistribute inequalities. Uh, we, we, we've got to be very careful, in my view, of sort of moving into missions uh, of conscience at this stage. I think the missions of conscience can be justified once you've got the case study stories, analysis on your plate, and once you then talk to others of us and say, well, actually, your, your, your outrageous project it, it, it was because of the politicians of the time who were trying, uh, you know, but we actually have taken a difference. I, I think we need to compare stories. We need to compare analyses, understand where the influences are. Who, who are the main actors? Who are the main influences? What models of thinking were they using? Um, and, and then we, we can sort of come up with where we go from here, given that's the history of... of a mega transport project delivery. Yes, the idea is to talk about the facts of the case. To inform our judgment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
is uh, talking about models and uh, um, it, it struck me that you made such a strong distinction between strategic planning and projects. Uh, as I believe that uh, one of the potential solutions of dealing with problems of complexity and uncertainty and so on is that projects uh, behave more in strategic ways and uh, some forms of strategic learning should be incorporated in managing complex projects. And you said, well, this is a completely different world. On the one hand, there is strategic planning, but it's completely different than setting up projects. Maybe, then the question is, how can we make projects? And with that, I mean the, the framing of actors that are involved, that are not involved, the selection of actors that are involved, the selection of concepts that are dealt with, um, the setting up of the whole thinking and acting program. Um, I think that's, uh, that's the purpose of projects or not. Um, the point I was trying to um, make was that uh, project delivery outside of strategy, which I call, I've nicknamed projectitis. It's basically you just deliver projects uh, because you need them on a piecemeal basis and it all adds up, but not, it doesn't add up to a strategy or it doesn't add up to a master plan if you want to be, since we're in the RIBA, you can use that terminology. Um, there, there is a difference between having a strategy in which you see the fast train program playing a major part, uh, perhaps providing the transport spine of a sub-regional development or of something else. It's different, that's different from uh, having a, the case being put for a project uh, individually on its own merits, being pushed forward by politicians on the basis of its own port barrel sort of uh, mentalities. Now, that's one situation. The argument is that you're not going to get strategic thinking just by responding to locational needs and then delivering the projects, which don't add up. Um, having said that, it is quite evident from our, and it's no secret, I think, from the work we've done in CTRL, that some projects, as they grow, as they emerge, suddenly become strategic because times have made them, have placed them. I mean, the CTRL has become far more the Channel Tunnel Rail Link has become far more strategic since the Olympic Games a bid has been successful, for example, or far more successful since the shortage of housing in London required a whole area for redevelopment outside of London. And so, this, this, so this, that project has now become strategic. But if you look at the story of its evolution, I know I'm a correct Phil, Phil's done the research really, uh, the, the, the history of the project actually doesn't have that strategic role, am I right, to, you know, to the strength that we see it now. And in that regard, that's, that's what happens. I'm sure it happens in the military. You, you, you have a particular campaign that you didn't realize was strategic. And then once it's been pursued, my God, you know, mm -hmm. there are oil fields in the area we've suddenly invaded, you know. And, uh, so let's invite, the, uh, let's invite the BP to come in and... Oh, we've got another subject, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you can help make it strategic, I guess. That's, that's right, mm -hmm. yeah. I think it's... Uh, sorry, I'm just I, I think the point is that a lot of these projects have strategic uh, impact, even though they may start... Well, the emphasis starts out as being uh, upon uh, delivery, upon delivery... Um, in budget on time, but there are all these ripples moving out from that, which are just about strategic in their influence. Um, and the criticism, I think, is uh, has been that the um, traditional way is success in terms of delivery time and budget, and all the other ramifications and implications of strategic impacts have been uh, ignored at the outset. And lo and behold, they, they come along, they accrue, uh, they emerge over time. We use some sort of that mm. complexity um, terminology. Mm. That would be, at the time, uh, there was a very strategic argument made for the Channel Tunnel. Um, I was 
invited to tender for the job of reviewing the traffic and revenue forecasts about 20 years ago. <clears throat> and I've just recently, uh, for my forthcoming conference on, on critical infrastructure, pulled out of my archive the, the front cover of one of the first prospectuses. Um, and it had a, um, a map showing this uh, network from the, the French coast uh, expanding throughout the whole of Europe, focused on, on the Channel, Channel Tunnel, and from the English end, another network branching out through the whole of the UK, um, showing the strategic importance of the Channel Tunnel. And around that, uh, in concentric circles, were travel time distances to the Channel. Um, and I think why I didn't get the job was I, I, I made the mistake of referring to this as the IRA dartboard. <laughs> because for the, for the tunnel to <coughs> succeed commercially, it represented such a large increase in capacity, it would have had to, to succeed, it would have had to drive out of business all of the other, all of the other ferry hooks. And so the country would have become dependent on this one pair of undefendable holes in the ground for its willingness to be uh, continent. It, would, it, it was, um, but at the time, uh, that was you know that strategic element wasn't noticed. It was just going to be a strategic link in, in this um, network, which was going to connect us with, with Europe, and it was going to be faster than the ferry, so it was a good thing. There's also a reason why it's, the, the channel, there's a strategic reason, I think, why the Channel Tunnel wasn't built. Hundred years earlier, actually, which was that the French would use it to invade the British. So, so that, well, <laughs> I was about to say, yeah, yeah, Napoleon had a strategic vision of what that tunnel could do. Um, I, I, th I think this this goes on to the illustrate the point that actually, it's not that the vision, the strategic vision, didn't exist, and, and, and perhaps that's more the point that's emerging out of discussion, is that it actually didn't become the main argument for the driving force. For it until retrospect analysis. I mean, TENS, the TENS program, the European TENS program, gave it post rationality, it, it, it gave it legitimacy. Um, so it's, you, you're right in that the link with Europe is strategic by its very nature, um, and, and the railway, you would have thought, uh, was therefore a natural strategic infrastructure. But then, pray explain to me why there was a slow train and still is linking the strategic infrastructure to London. Uh, it, th this is where the, the, the reality of reality <laughs> impinges on the vision that never tipped. Well, um, I, can, I can explain that as well, because they started digging in, I think it was 1974, and they stopped when they realized it was going to be unaffordable. Um, and the, the, the affordability, what made it unaffordable uh, <clears throat> was the, the high-speed links to London. And so they said, high-speed links aren't necessary. It'll, it can be justified without the high-speed links. And so they, they came back and had another go, and, um, and, and I, they got that through. And then having got that through, they came back and said, oh, we need the high-speed links. OK, that's very helpful. Um, I mean, that's just really an illustration of how much you pick up from the storytelling experience and you put it together. The, the other piece of... Um, information I had, because I, I started this kind of work about 10 years ago when I was working in Denmark, and I interviewed some people on, on the Channel Tunnel Rally, and, and what uh, a retiring, one of the many retiring directors since, I think, said to me was, you have to realize that uh, there are many stories about this project, and they're not lying, it's just that they're different perspectives on the same event. Um, and, and this is why storytelling is, is so important. The statistics are as, as misleading as the stories which are biased. Uh, and, and this is why I think we need to accumulate. And in, in our website, what we're hoping to do is to be able to, to plonk stories at the, well, we'll explain that later on, at the background to project profiles. Uh, then we can have the storylines totally explaining. And it may be totally contradictory storylines about the same, the same event. I don't think we're into the business here of um, necessarily rewriting history. We're into the business of, which I think is, and um, perhaps I should con conclude on that, because it's almost one minute to five. Um, I, I think what's most exciting about what we're trying to do is to put the first 
um, set of data of 30 mega or 31 mega transport projects in the world in a format that we can compare, examine, and look at the history to see whether there's any emerging patterns. And it, even just by, by putting that information down gives an in-depth that hasn't been provided. And this is quite astounding because this is the most expensive infrastructure um, that we, apart from getting to the moon, that we're, that we're seeing. And the ramifications of it are, are immense, one way or the other, positive or negative. Um, and in that regard, storytelling, statistics, images, facts, and then comparing notes um, will gradually evolve. The, the, just to conclude then, uh, it, it's quite apparent, I hope, and we'll talk about this in subsequent days, that anyone who's got a vision and, and, and a, an idea that we're going to go systematically from point A to point Z by predetermined course of research methodology with statistical tests at point A, B, C, and D should leave the room straight away, because it's not going to be like that. Um, we, we're going to accumulate knowledge, we're going to share it and compare it, and then use it as a learning process for the, for the, the basis forward. Is there a last question before we close the day and I thank speakers? But I, I, do, I would very much like to, to thank the three Johns and of course my, my colleague Richard. Um, it's not an easy uh, task for you to accept an invitation um, in a profession in which you probably have no real dealings, although unfortunately um, our worlds have come closer together through diseases and through military um, implications of terrorism and, and the city and transportation. So ironically, <coughs> what was seen at one time, a fairly separate set of disciplines, actually we can see it coming together. Um, and I hope that this, this is the first of, there will be another one next year when we will invite other parties who have similarly um, have been commissioned to write some papers. These papers will be with us hopefully very soon. Um, we will put them on website so that um, I think it's, at some stage it will be just for the partners for, to use and, and we will have to see uh, publishing all of them in the form of a book, hopefully. Um, later down the line. Thank you very much, um, Three Johns and Richard. Thank you.